if you got this invitation in the mail, how would you respond? You know, RSVP, you know, I think it means something in French, or something like that. Uh, it basically means, please tell me whether you're coming or not. But if it said, misery loves company, we would love to have you at our pity party. You know, if you got that invitation, how would you respond? And the reason I start with that is that a lot of people uh, really do love uh, to be miserable. Uh, they like it. They enjoy it. They're only happy when they're sad. Uh, and it means a lot to them, as the old phrase goes, you know, misery loves company, that it's kind of like, hey, if I'm sad, I want the whole world to be sad with me, right? If I'm singing a sad song, if I'm in the blues, I want to walk into the blues club with other people who are also singing the blues, right? I don't want people singing happy songs when I'm sad. And so when you think about this, a lot of people are hoping that the world will RSVP positively to their negativity, right? <laughs> to their pity party. Um, we're commiserating, you know, come commiserate with us. And when I was in high school, I worked at a nursing home, which was very instructive, actually. I mean, I, I worked in the serving and, and cleaning of dishes and all the rest. And, and it was a, an important thing, I think, for a young man to see old men. Uh, there was really only one old man, from what I remember, and he didn't know his name, but there were like 10 trillion ladies and one guy, is, is basically what I remember. But when I think about that, people would sit around the tables and trade tales of woe. That's what they would do. I would walk by as I'm serving things and, oh, you think that's bad? Well, you should, uh, you know, my back is this and my elbow is that and my so-and-so is flaring up and everything. And, and they would just spend hours upon hours upon hours in this place, one-upping each other for how horrible their life had been, how horrible it was and all the rest. And, you know, I'd serve and I'd try to serve with a smile and all the rest of that. But there's a healthy part of friendship, of course, where we can share our struggles. And nobody should ever feel like they have to put on the plastic smile uh, to go through uh, life as a Christian. I'm not knocking the fact that sometimes, again, we do uh, need somebody to lean on during those times. But the phrase, misery loves company, is kind of pointing out a more sinister side, a more cynical side, a more sick side of human nature, which is this, which is there's sometimes a pattern or a mindset, again, where I'm only happy if you're unhappy. I'm only wanting you to come into my sorrow, right? And only satisfied if you're dissatisfied. See, I call them grump clumps. I've got all kinds of words for them, but I'm like, if somebody's forming a grump clump and they invite me into it, I'm like, nah, I'll just sit over here by myself, truly, because I would rather have a little bit of fun by myself than no fun over there with you. And again, I, I think about those things. There are secret societies, you know, whole things that are all geared toward sorrow. We're just sad. We're full of angst. We're mad. We're, we're disillusioned. We're complaint filled. You know, our complaint box is overflowing and we're accepting new members, but only if they're as old and miserable as we are, right? I mean, we want to make sure that can happen at any age, right? I'm not saying old people. Part of what you see in this passage is sometimes young people are already old. You're like, what are you, what are you so cynical for? What are you so burned out about? And when you think about that, if someone's living under a dark cloud and the only bright side to their life is getting people to get under that dark cloud with them and join the pity party, well, that's what I mean when I say misery does sometimes love company. And you're going to see that in the book of Mark here, that it's a strange aspect of human nature. And it's never more evident, I think, than when it comes to religious groups, when it comes to religion as a thing. You know, you think about what this book is introduced as, the gospel of Mark. And you know, it's, it's good news. That's what gospel means. It means good news, the good news of Jesus. And yet, I know people who, who are pretty sure that it's the bad news of Jesus. You know, that, that when they present it, when they bring it into a person's life, it's basically, would you like to co-minister, commiserate with us? Would you like to come and be sad like we are? Can you, can you be as mad at everyone as we are? Can we be as judgmental and critical and cynical as possible? Can we be hypercritical and hypocritical, right? And there's always room for more misery in our company. I don't know if you know anyone like that. I don't know if you've met people like that. I don't know if you've been anywhere like that. But some people think Jesus was like that, that he was like super serious. You know, that when you see the paintings of him, he's always frowning or often frowning. He's a very sour looking guy. He doesn't look like much fun to be around, at least in the pictures I see painted. If you go through a museum, you're like, that guy does not look like the life of the party. 
And when you think about that, he's kind of got this furrowed brow, you know, and he's got this look in his eye that's kind of like, I'm watching you, and all that kind of stuff. And, and you think about the ministry of misery. And Mark tells us just the opposite. Just the opposite is true. And so people loved Jesus' ministry because he wasn't bringing the ministry of misery. See, I think about it this way. Ministry loves compassion. Like, misery loves company. But ministry, true ministry, loves compassion. What's compassion? Compassion is to do something with passion, with, with a, a, a sense of involvement and, and life into it, you know? And so you think about this. People loved Jesus' ministry because he brought ministry to misery. He would love and they would love being around his company. He brought joy, he brought freedom, and dare I say, he brought fun to life? See, and that caused a lot of people to freak out. It did then, it does now sometimes. There's some people who really think somewhere deep down that if we laugh a little too loud, God might be mad. Like, shh, you know, God's in the hush ministry. Hush, 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 settle down, down there. See, and that caused a lot of people, again, in his day, that no, 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 that God is all about no. God is all about no, 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 no. And so when you think about an invitation to that party, if that was the party, I think I'd say no. You want to join us? No. You want to join my pity party? We're having a terrible time, and it'd be even worse with you. Uh, you know what? Count me out on this one. Would it attract you? Would you want to be a part of that? And so again, I, I kind of put two words out, like I often do the, in my own life, to think about these as contrasts. And, and it's this, is your faith, would you want to attend a pity party? Would you want to attend it? Some people would say, yeah, I'd fit right in. No, I'm talking about like, do you want people to attend yours? No. Do you want to attend others? No. So it should make us think about this. Is our faith a feast whoops, or a fast? Is it a feast or a fast. What's a fast? Well, you know, fasting, you know, people talk about it. There's the Daniel fast. And, and I, please understand, I'm not saying that there's never a place for either of these or that it's always one continual feast in life. But if you were to characterize your life, if you were to look at your faith, if you were to say day to day consistently, is it more characterized by the word feast or is it more characterized by the word fast? Because fast is basically saying no to something and feast is saying yes. Feast is having a big tray brought around. You go, why's it got to be or? Would you like one of these? And you go, why's it got? Is it one? Is it limit one? Uh, can I have more? And I think again, when you when you look at the life of Jesus, sometimes people right away think I'm talking about money when I talk about feasting or or you know physical things. He, he, Jesus came to bring the abundant life, whatever that is, an abundance of life, right? And so when I think of, again, the life of the party or a lively party, do you picture Jesus at it or do you picture him frowning at it? Do you picture him with people gathered around him laughing or do you picture people uh, scowling in the corner with him? Because when you think about it, again, a fast is deprivation. It's stoic. It's no, no. It's what you do without. A feast is bring it on, right? And so it seems like there are those who think that spiritual means miserable. The more miserable you are, the more spiritual you must be. If you never crack a smile, you must really, really be spiritual. And I think about this, and again, I'm not making this stuff up. I know a guy who's a phenomenal speaker, very spiritual guy, great, great friend of mine. And you know what? He was asked to do a speech, but they specifically said in the speech, but don't. Don't use so much humor like you do. And he said, man, I can't accept that. I can't accept that, that role. I mean, I don't even know what you're talking about because this is who I am. It's basically come speak, but don't be you, right? Don't do what you do. Don't do what you do to connect to people. And I was like, man, turn it down. RSVP, no. That if somebody tells you come, but it's a very somber situation, then... Wow, that's, that's kind of sad. Again, he's, he's a guy who's going to adjust his message. I know him to be that. But again, to be told, don't do that. Don't do that funny stuff you do. It's like, eh, no thanks. And so when you think about this, life is to be endured for some people. But for others, life's to be enjoyed. Are there things we have to endure? Of course. But again, I think of the pitch. I think of the sales job that you do. Like, hey, we're miserable. 
come to Christ and be just as miserable as we are? And you go, well, I don't know. I wonder why no one accepts my RSVP. See, you think about this. Jesus was known for his joy, right? It says in the Bible he, he wanted his joy to be in them. Now, he was a man familiar with sorrows and suffering. So they're not mutually exclusive. But the faith that Jesus brought and that he taught was more of a feast for people than a fast. He wasn't always saying, no, 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 calm down. He was always saying, yes, yes, yes. See, and again, I don't mean to be insensitive, insensitive even in the context of these days we live, but, but Jesus managed to put the F-U in in funeral. See, I've done a lot of funerals in my life, and you know what? I've even done funerals for friends, and the bottom line is all of them asked, in advance who got a chance to do that, please have some fun at my funeral. Please tell some stories of the stupid stuff I did. And I think of the times where mixture of cheers and joy have been there, and, and that's reality, that's life. That's the moment where one story just breaks your heart and the next one breaks your gut as you're laughing about it. And I think about that and I say, Jesus, only Jesus could do that. He frequently interrupted funerals and said, hey, 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 let's bring the party back in here. And again, I think about that. It's, it's an incredible thought that his first miracle was at a wedding feast and he saved a newlywed couple whose party was about to get pooped. And he says, you know what? Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. There's some more stuff in the back. Bring it on, you know, and stuff like that. And you go, wow, interesting. Again, am I advocating debauchery and all the things that leads to sorrow? No, Jesus didn't either. But Jesus' miracles were parables. And it's meant to demonstrate physically what Jesus came to do spiritually. And the Lord came to bring life. And when we miss that, we miss the message. We mess up the message. And people don't want to RSVP to that. See, I think about this, the Christian life was meant to be a feast, a spiritual feast, a continual supply. That you go like, are we out? Nope, we're not. We haven't even opened the extra box yet. And you go, wow, that's amazing. Not a ministry of misery, but a ministry to misery. See, it's a celebration. And when you think about that, there's a lot more yeses than knows in God's word. I'm giving this introduction because I think it's such an important concept. It's so easy to miss it when we come to the scripture. And, and it's funny because, again, people would read this and totally miss the point of what this is. People will stoically read this, so may it be, and God's word, and click and go off to the company of misery anyway. And you go, how could that be? So I promised you at the beginning of, of Mark that we would always have good news here at Glasshouse. That if you're getting bad news anywhere in your life, you could at least come here one hour a week and get some good news. So here we go. I think about this again, way more yeses than no's in God's word. All the way back to Genesis. Remember the story of Adam and Eve, so well known? He's, God said, of all trees of the garden you may eat, except one. Has anyone ever really thought about that? He didn't say, this is the one tree you can eat of, you can't have anything else. I put a ton of stuff in the garden, but you only have to eat this one thing every day. That wasn't his heart. It's never been his heart. His heart has always been, there are a couple things I got to tell you no for, because you need to know they're not going to lead to the life that you want. But more than that, I love to say yes. And as a parent, I love to say yes. I tell my kids all the time, help me say yes. Make yes easy. Don't make no easy. Make yes easy. And so when you think about that, the religious rulers in Jesus' day, they rejected that perspective completely. They didn't get it at all. They were the party. You know, you talk about different political parties. They were the party pooper party. I, really. I mean, that's who I would say they were. They were just sour and dour party. I mean, like, come join us. You mad at everyone? You sad about everything? Come join our party. And you think about this, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you know why they were sad, you see? Well, the Pharisees were not fair, I see, and the Sadducees were sad, I see, because the scribes, let me describe the scribes. All they did was write down the scripture and miss the message. This is what they did. Their job was write it down. I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Did you just write that? Did you just read that? Do you have any idea what that means? No, I can quote it. And as a matter of fact, you misquoted it. You missed a word, you know, and stuff like that. And you go, wow, how did you miss it? They couldn't bear to watch Jesus openly ignore their perspective 
and RSVP no to their party and ha open a party of his own. Say, hey guys, I'm opening this to the last, the least, and the lost. Anyone want to come? And so the first two chapters of Mark, Jesus had already been breaking religious traditions everywhere he went. It was like he tried to. It's exactly like he tried to. See, Jesus bypassed the rabbinical schools. That's where you would have normally gathered your group, right? Let's get my inside group and my inside circle and we'll find the most well taught theological students. He didn't. He went down to the fisherman's wharf and said, wow, there's, these guys look interesting. Uh, these are a smelly bunch. We'll see what we can do with them. And when you think about it, what came in a chapter just before, do you remember it? It was a leper. Jesus healed a leper who became a leaper. Do you think that guy seriously threw a very tiny little party? If you had leprous disease and you were cleansed, do you think you might have wanted to gather some of your friends and do some dancing? I suppose so. And yet people were like, don't do that. No, 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 no. Please, calm down. It's so disrespectful, so, you know, irreligious to be so excited. And so you think about this. Jesus actually ate dinners with sinners. Dinner, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner and all that stuff. Well, his was sinner dinner, right? And when Levi, the tax collector, threw a party for his lost friends, guess who RSVP'd yes? Jesus. He's like, yeah, I'll come to that. That sounds good. Who's going to be there? All your bum friends? Awesome. Um, and that's where we left off last week, right? you got to remember, Mark chapter 2, verse 16. This is where we pick it up. The scribes and Pharisees see Jesus eating. You can look at it, your page there and see in verse 16, it says, they, the Pharisees and scribes saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and the sinners. They said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? What they're asking is, how is he part of this party? How can he be a religious, spiritual man and be in that place? Because if you were in a good place, you wouldn't be there with those bad people. And verse 17, Jesus heard it. He told the religious rulers, well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So he goes like, hey, man, we're just kind of having a a uh, house call from the doctor. The doctor is down among the sick, and that's cool, right? And so I, I wrote down this thought, and these are some of them are kind of out of order, so we'll see if I got them right. But God's not a party pooper, right? That one's there. That's an important one to think on. We'll just meditate on that for a moment. Uh, but holiness is wholeness. What's he saying? Like, some people think holiness is, you know, that you never are around bad things. But when you think about wholeness and wellness, holiness is somebody who goes in among sick people, right? Not to get sick themselves, but simply to say, you know what? Ministry to misery, right? Jesus came to minister to the miserable, to help the hurting, and you can't help the hurting from afar. You can't say, uh, y'all, uh, hope you're doing all right down there. You know, let me chuck you some change over the balcony every once in a while. You know, something like that. And you think about this, psychology tells us something that you don't have to believe the Bible to know this is true, which is that people get in a rut and they're actually happy with their familiar unhappiness, right? It's their go-to move. They're like, they've got a rut, they've got a route, and I only function in my dysfunction, right? And if all I do is my misery loves company and I congregate with other people just as miserable as I am, there's nobody injected into that who has maybe a different perspective, somebody who has... Uh, an antidote to that. And see, when you think about that, Jesus is in the midst of misery, healing, helping, touching, and all that, and teaching. And he came to give grace. He came to change lives. He came to show hope, to show love. And that's what he's calling us to do. If you want to be like Jesus, his company, he kept company with miserable people, <laughs> you know, the miserables. But he came to turn their lives from fast to feast. I mean, that's what he came to do. He came to say, hey, you're living on breadcrumbs when you could have the whole loaf. You're living on leftovers when you could be living so different and have even a surplus of overflow of emotion and spirituality to give to others, right? You could live a surplus life. And so when you think about this, the Pharisees weren't happy with that happening. They didn't like it because they actually felt better when they saw other people doing worse. 
Do you know anyone like that? I only feel good when you do bad, right? Oh, well, not as bad as that person. They had a rigid religion that gave, gave them the capacity to look down on most of humanities. They had a legal list, they checked it twice, and they thought everyone else was naughty and they were nice, right? You know that. They majored in the minors, they minored in the majors, and every song they sang was in a minor key, right? And so that misery loved company, you know, E minor hangs out with D minor. And, and they just like to do that, right? But a major key, too happy, no happy songs, not in their church, right? No happy songs. We're happy in our sour society. And so you think about this, Jesus was a very serious threat to their somber, self-righteous, serious, serious system of spirituality, which was a look down on you thing. Jesus was having such a good time, it really bugged him. There must be something wrong with him. Why is this guy so happy all the time? And so they began to find fault. And that's what you see, verse 18. We continue on, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. And they came to him and said, why did the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? So you remember he had just said, why is he going to the feast at all? And then after the after party afterwards, they're still talking about it. They're still mad. And they're like, man, we, we are skipping meals for God. And you guys are eating with ungodly people. And Jesus and his disciples were feasting, right? You see that. That's what it says in verse 18. And the Pharisees and others in town were fasting at the same time. And the disciples of John are mentioned. And I think it's important to know who those were. Those were leftover disciples of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was an amazing prophet of God, an important prophet of God. But the, the Bible does say he's the last of the Old Covenant prophets, the last of the Old Testament you know, mouthpieces. And so you may remember John the Baptist's desert diet was kind of something I would have fasted from, locusts and wild honey. I would have said, if someone had brought it round on the tray, you know, at the John the Baptist meeting, I would have said, nah, not so much. I'm fasting today. Oh, how spiritual. You know, you like, yuck. You know, I don't need that. But, but these were a, a group who, who were drawn to his very severe message. He had a severe message, and there's a place for that. You understand. I know that, right? But his message was one of sorrow for sin, of repentance, of all this. But it was a preparation for Jesus to come. It was that you would repent and get ready for the good news of Jesus, an impending judgment. But it, he wasn't wanting to bring judgment any more than Jesus wants to bring judgment. There's a reason and a season for it. And the bad news of John set the stage for the good news of Jesus. And repentance was getting ready for the feast, right? And you may know, if you know the chronology, that John the Baptist was in prison by this point. And he had, before he got, went to prison, told his followers, don't follow me anymore. Follow Jesus. I, I was just here to get, like, I'm the warm-up band. I, that's all I am. Take off my fan shirt and put on the Jesus shirt, right? Forget this. This was to get you ready for that. You should be fans of Jesus, not fans of John the Baptist. But a few of them said, no, no, no. We like the locust and wild honey wilderness life. We like sand in our shoe and in our shorts. We like it when it's rough and tough and terrible and everything's mad and we're sunburned and blistered for God. And he said, well, okay, you could do that. And so they stayed loyal to that. And they were rightly upset about what had happened to John, right? And they were fasting. And again, I don't mean to, to you know, downplay it, but the Pharisees. And now the disciples of John were together. These guys hadn't been together. Remember, John the Baptist had told the Pharisees, you're a bunch of snakes. You're a brood of vipers. You are hypocrites. You are total bums. And now misery loving company there were people left over who had missed the message entirely and they're now clumping together in a grump clump you see it happening right here the pharisees had implemented rules and traditions that were not given by god and these leftover disciples who hadn't decided to do what john the baptist said which is go follow jesus they're like no we're still stuck in our fast we don't understand the message of feast we don't even get it and so twice a week, the scholars tell us that these scholars would fast. They would go without food. They would go without water. Okay, twice a week, two times, two times a week. And they would make sure everyone knew how miserable they were in that moment. Oh, I'm fasting because I'm very godly. Do you want to join our group? And you're like, no, um, I'm not really into that. And so they were, and Jesus addressed it several times. He said, if you, if you do fast, 
do it in a way that God knows it and other people don't. But you know, again, misery loves company. If I'm sacrificing, I want everyone in the room to know. And so they'd wear uncomfortable clothes and they'd whack themselves with sticks and they'd say this was spiritual stuff and read your history books. You'll see it's true. There's people to this day who think the worse it feels, the more God likes it. And you know, God just, he just loves when we, you know, are miserable people. And they would suck in their cheeks and they would say, man, we're so godly. God's so impressed. And so scholars, again, will also tell us this is what's interesting. They didn't even read their own writings. God had commanded one day of fasting once a year. You know when it was? Leviticus 16. It was the Day of Atonement. There was one day in the feast and fast schedule of the Jewish system. One day out of the whole year. One day called the Day of Atonement. And that was a day to mourn. That was a day to say, you know what? It, life isn't one big party. There's things I've done that are wrong. There's things pe that are going wrong. And we should, we should take that seriously. It's not one big joke. Life is not a joke. But the lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the nation on that day. And it was a picture of Jesus. And it was a picture of all of these things that would come. But it's interesting that, think of God's ratio. I think I wrote it down here. I hope I did. Even the Old Testament had one fast and seven feasts. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of the ratio? These are God's commands in his holy law. Was one day without food, guys. But check out the feasts. Seven feasts. And many of them were a week or more long. And you know what they were? They were dancing and whooping it up. They were shouting. They were getting lots of food in the belly all right these guys were having a great time and when i think about this god ordained fun god is not a spoil sport he's into ministry not misery and again contextually it's likely that levi's feast for his friends was during one of those two pharisaical fasts because they were twice a week and and, and you see him saying we're, we're hungry and you're over there having a good time with jesus and we don't like it why aren't you doing it like we are? And you know what? There's that grumbly tummy moment where you can be kind of extra mad just because you're hungry. And maybe they needed some food. I don't know. But verse 18 says, why aren't you as miserable as we are? Why aren't you doing it right by feeling wrong? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom's with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. They'll fast in those days. And I stop real quickly there in verse 20 because, again, the Christian faith should be more feast than famine, more feast than fast, more yes than no, more what God wants to pour into your life than what he wants to pull out of it, right? I mean, and yet the ratio in most people's life is God wants to trickle little things in, but boy, he just wants to pull all the fun out of my life. I've heard people who live that way. And it's been a lot of times in my life that I've been to weddings, but you know what? I've never picked a day to diet when I was going to a wedding. Um, there have been different times in my life where I've realized, whoa, too much feasting. Got to do a little bit of leasting, right? I got to do, <laughs> do a little bit of exercise because I want to continue to enjoy the life that God has given me a little longer, right? But there, when I'm talking about feasting, I'm talking about feasting on all the good things of life, right? Friendship, feasting on friendship. No, I'm not fasting on friendship right now. You know, don't need people. But I think about a wedding, most recent one, my nephew, um, Ryan, uh, got married and, and that was awesome and I got to do that wedding and people were shocked because we had a good time. I told jokes, we laughed, everyone was like, this is the most, I laughed at a wedding. And you're like, of course, oh, of course you laughed at a wedding. We had a great time, serious catering, um, great band. Band was amazing. Oh, I would walk 500 miles and all the rest was played. It was amazing. And the groom, what if the groom had come to our table to see how we were doing afterwards and we were like all somber? Great wedding, bro. Yeah, we're honoring the day by having no fun. Notice is my plate's empty. Do you want some food? No, I'm fasting today. Our family has chosen this as a fast before the Lord. You'd go like, what? I think it's a good time to just show how godly I am by having a terrible time in the midst of a party. 
And you go, wait, wait, this is a wedding feast, my friends. This is not a hunger strike. There's time for that if you need to do that. The groom's here, the bride's here, they're celebrating life and love. This would be a wonderful time to go with that flow, right? This would be a time for feasting, not fasting. This is a time for celebration, not sorrow. And when I think about this, again, Jewish wedding feasts lasted for a week or more. Or, I mean, just, just blowouts. I mean, amazing. One of the happiest times in a person's life. They had a hard life. They had an agrarian society. These guys lived sometimes on just barely making it, not knowing where the next thing would come. And yet there were these things that they would look forward to and say, feast. And can you imagine the illustration Jesus is using? Can you imagine the once in a lifetime party? And you go, no, I don't want to be a part of that. I, God probably doesn't want me to do that. Jesus was trying to say to him, spiritually, you're missing the party, folks. <laughs> and in the midst of all this life being given, uh, you're just a company of misery. And Jesus was comparing, uh, uh, comparing himself to a groom who gives everyone a reason to rejoice at the feast. You know, the groom always wants to make sure everyone's having a good time, right? Having a good time. You having a good time? You having a good time? Why aren't you having a good time? You know, that sort of thing. Don't, they don't want to look out there and see someone miserable at their marriage, right? And using the, the analogy here for the Pharisees to understand that you're totally out of step with God. I mean, God sent his son as the bridegroom to the bride, and it's supposed to be a moment, a life of enjoyment. And Jesus, he's not teaching against fasting. In fact, we can do it. He did it. The guidelines he gave are in Matthew 6, 16, if you ever want to look them up. But it's basically feasting spiritually is what fasting is. It's just saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to gorge myself on spiritual thoughts. And it really, you know, cooking and, and cleaning up pans and doing all that stuff takes forever and chopping all the little things. And you're like, I, it'd probably take me three hours to make a great meal right now. But what if I spent three hours feeding my soul with some soul food? That is what fasting is spiritually in Scripture. Okay, so there's a place for that. But it's not a hunger strike to, to I, God, I will starve myself until you do something I need you to do. That's, I've seen it treated that way. And so he says, there'll come a time for that. There'll come a time when you won't even, nah, I don't feel hungry, man. After the cru crucifixion, he said the groom was taken from him. Believe me, the disciples were like, yeah, this really isn't my best day ever, you know? And so when you think about this, Jesus is with us now, he's alive. And that means that the ratio of feast to fast, it just got to, we got to look at it and say, yeah, life's going to be a continual feast with occasional fast, not a continual fast with occasional feast, right? Which way is it going to be? Again, I'm not in any way saying that life is easy. It is not easy. I'm a person prone to pity parties, you know, pity party, party of one, um, you know, but, but I think about this, Jesus is giving the antidote for it right here. He's saying, don't think I, don't blame me for it. Don't tell me, oh, well, you know, it's spiritual things. No, it isn't. We have every reason to celebrate spiritual things. The groom is here. The groom's alive. And you think about this. He uses two pictures to paint dead religion and what it was. You know him, I think. Verse 21 to 22, look at it. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts, the wineskins, the wine is spilled, the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. See, I had something happen to me recently, which is I had a, um, it, it gets cold right, right at night, and I had a uh, LaCroix, uh, which is, <laughs> is, you know, wonderful stuff. It's like sparkling water. And it, the, the can was left outside, and it, it, it just, let's say it expanded, the inside expanded more than the outside. And so in my car was it fortunately still frozen, a bursted LaCroix. Uh, it busted right out of the can. Now, fortunately it didn't thaw and do all the stuff it could have done. But what's the point? He's basically using a uh, illustration like that to say if something isn't flexible, if it isn't stretchable, if it can't expand itself it's just going to burst and blow and what's it going to do it's going to ruin the can and it's going to spill the contents and this is what he talks about he uses two illustrations shrunk jeans and unshrunk patch and all this stuff what was he saying he was saying something really important i think i got it in the right order the stretchy will be blessed the starchy will be stressed okay this is it 
Um, now, again, what do I mean by the starchy? You know what I'm talking about? Starched collars? Like, you know, religious collars. That's what they look like. Why do they look like that? I don't know. This is a stretchy shirt. I wore it on purpose. This is my feast shirt, right? This is my fun shirt. This is a fiesta shirt, man. Where's the party? I don't know. Uh, but the stretchy will be blessed. Man, the starchy, if, if this shirt were two sizes too small and really rigid, I would not be very blessed right now. I'd feel very stressed. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's making this point. The rigid, worn-out traditions that they had, they weren't God-given. They were man-made. See, God-given things actually bring joy into your life when they're obeyed. But man-made things, they bring sorrow into your life when they're obeyed. You can never please man. But God is pleasable. See, you think about this. He says, I didn't just come to patch up an old way of thinking about God. You guys have been thinking about God this way for so long. You have your Sabbath rules, right? And you think about this again. Their ministry had become misery. This is what they thought of it is. That we are appointed to keeping everybody in line and miserable with the law. And Jesus was like, yikes. See, starchy, inflexible. They had a concept of God as the great rule maker in the sky. The great, you know, person being called to every party to shut it down. The spiritual spoil sport, right? And again, I don't know how you think of God, but God doesn't want you to think of him that way. The do this, don't do that God. Um, I, I think of how many people I have met who I have had so many conversations about them not believing in God. And when they describe the God they don't believe in, I'm like, I don't believe in him either. I don't believe in that God. That's the God you believe in? I don't believe in that one. I'm an atheist toward that God too. I don't believe in that God. Don't reject the Jesus that you think is that. This is the guy who got rejected for being too much fun. He wasn't dejected enough, so he was rejected for not being dejected. See, they have a spiritual sense of right and wrong, but they were wrong. And there's so many people who think, man, I either, I want to be guilty, so I want to make you guilty. I feel guilty, I feel bad, I want you to feel bad. Misery loves company, right? It's part of that psychological thing where I go like, if I am living under tremendous guilt, I can't stand to see you not feeling guilty. So, rather than... Asking you, how are you so free? I start finding fault with your freedom. And I say, if you were spiritual, if you were godly, you'd be as bummed out as I am. Starchy. And so when I think about this, if our religious life is like that, nobody's going to want to RSVP to that party. When it comes to the central facts of the faith, yeah, I, I have a lot of immovable objects in my life. You know, I'm steadfast and immovable on a few things. But like I said, the, the, the things that are God-given, I don't really move much on those things. But the things that are man-made, get it out of here. See, I like to think of it like this house. This house has two types of walls. Very important thought. Load-bearing walls, decorative walls. You can blow a decorative wall out and nothing happens. You blow a, man, a, a decorative wall out and house stays up. You blow a load-bearing wall out and the house falls down. So there are a few truths in my life. Nobody's moving that. No way I'm immovable on it. But guess what? Decorative walls, I'm like, yeah, blow it out. Change it. I don't care. There are very few things like that. And that's what I love about it is God is not a legalist with a legalist. He's not like, you know, uh, doing all these things. He's not a rule maker, making up rules all the time. Hey, we don't have enough. Um, that whole Ten Commandments thing, you know what's interesting? When Jesus talks about it in the New Testament, he says, let's just boil it down to two. He takes the ten down to two. Love God, love others. Uh, any details beyond that? And it's funny because man loves to expand. Ten ain't enough. We got to come up with a lot more than ten. Ten is too few. And so when you think about this, it's very interesting, very interesting how that is. Pharisees, sticklers for the law. They used the law to condemn everyone else, to make everyone else as miserable as they were. And in this next section, starting in verse 23, think about it. He takes two Sabbath scenarios that make the obvious distinction, the difference between a fast and a feast. Verse 23, it happened when Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath as they went. His disciples began to pluck the grain, heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what's not lawful on the Sabbath? 
Now, it had been some days since Levi's feast. That's important to see the chronology just quickly. And I know I'm, I'm kind of racing against time here, but Jesus and his disciples were walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Why does it matter? That was a Saturday, by the way. Saturday is how we think of that. But when you think of what a Sabbath was, the disciples began to eat some wheat. You know, like they're just plucking some grains as they're walking through a field, right? And one of the other gospel accounts specifically says they were hungry. Like the feast that they'd had uh, kind of been several days. And, and it, maybe they'd gone without some meals. And they're like, they're not thinking it's the Sabbath. They're thinking, I'm hungry. And so the, the Pharisees confronted Jesus. This is awful. This is unlawful. And you think about this. I don't know how they popped up in the middle of the field. I think it's very funny. <laughs> but they're kind of like stalking them through the stalks, right? And the minute one of the guys goes, you know, like the little light goes off and everything. And you're like, the Pharisee scope has, has come in on and you're getting you. And you're like, what in the world? I saw that we have you on camera, you know, stealing wheat. And, you know, the thing is, it wasn't unlawful what they were doing. This is what's so funny is that the scripture scholars are, hypocrisy is always hypocritical. It, it picks and chooses, right? It's funny how they're picking wheat, but these guys are also picking scriptures. They're picking through things and saying, what truth supports my truth? See, Deuteronomy 23, 24, and 25, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 24 and 25, kind of easy to remember, 23, 24, 25, is... Um, specifically gives law saying this is okay it says if you're walking through a guy's field and you're hungry you can eat one of the oranges that's basically what it's saying okay if you're in florida you're cooking along through something and you're passing through somebody's vineyard and there's some grapes there or something you can have a few grapes nothing wrong with that now can you load your truck up with that person's stuff and start uprooting their trees and carrying it off? No. But what it basically says is human need is human need and God isn't all uptight about this. So the law actually provided for human hunger. Isn't that interesting? So the Sabbath was the issue for them. They were like, this is wrong because it's the Sabbath. See, we got you on a technicality because yeah, you could do this six days a week, but you can't do it this day a week because this is the day you're supposed to rest. Now, again, think about that. That's one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 10. You know what the, the commandment says? This is how God said it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All right, that's what God said. Hey, once a week, think about holy things, at least. I mean, don't go a week without thinking about, you know, don't just rush through your whole life and forget about this stuff. Go for, you're going so fast, you might not even have time to eat. He says, Sit down and rest, man. You got to rest sometime. Think about that. God prescribed rest. And what did mankind do? Wrote volumes. Go check them out at the library sometime. I promise you nobody's reading them. They're there. Um, huge volumes of minute minutia about what it is to rest or not rest on the Sabbath. Okay? I'll throw out a few of them for you. If you had a false leg because you'd, you'd, you'd lost a leg in an accident or from birth. You had a wooden leg. You couldn't wear it on the Sabbath. You know why? You were picking something up. Okay? So that, that seems a little counterintuitive. You know what else you couldn't do? You could not put false teeth in. Couldn't wear your dentures on Sabbath because um, it, you were using a tool to chew uh, rather than your God-given teeth. Right? These are... I'm not kidding. I didn't make these up. You'd think it's a joke book, but it's not. It, it's, these were serious infractions. These were things that they would get mad at people for. And again, I in no way try to make too much fun of different religious things, except sometimes I do. And so God said rest, and people made up the rest of these rules, right? Most of it is junk. You can disobey it all you want. You are hereby authorized by Jesus to completely ignore man-made rules. All right? Very important to think about. So when you think about that, God's commands are for our sake, not his. See, this, is, this right here would change anyone's life if they really understood it. Jesus said to them, verse 25, 
Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him? And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. What he basically says is, the rules were made to bless you. They weren't made for God's sake. Oh, do it for God's sake. God doesn't need anything done for God's sake. God gave it to us for our sake. He said, rest. And only, only miserable company could come up with books upon books upon books about what rest was and wasn't and find fault with people for doing that. This is what he's saying. Even if you read just the Bible, you're going to see what did David do? David went into the the holy place, and they had holy bread that was for God. Does God eat bread? It was called show bread. It was supposed to be symbolic for them, but this was like holy bread, and they were hungry. So what did they do? They ate the holy bread in the temple, and God didn't go, let it rot in your gut. No, he, he went, good. That was a great use of the holy bread. This would change, again, the perspective of 99.9% of, .9 of biblical interpretation when you realize that the rules were given to meet human need, not to meet God's need for us to be a certain way. He was trying to get us to be more like God. He's trying to get us to be more like God. What's God like? Don't touch the holy bread. No, he's like... Give the holy bread to the hungry. The holiest use of this bread is not for it to sit in a temple somewhere with a light shining on it, being, telling the kids, get away from that, get away from that. It's, it's, the holiest use is, you're hungry? Here, divide it up and give it. That's, what it. that's what he's saying to him. Jesus gives this incredible insight. Oh man, he had such a great sense of humor. How do we know? Because he told him, have you never read what David did? These were the scribes. They were the people who wrote what David did. <laughs> He's asking a Pharisee who's Mr. Scripture memory uh, you know, system. Oh, maybe you missed this verse. I don't know if you missed this one. I love it. And, and when you think about this, no law of God is properly interpreted in a way that ignores human need and places the law above the love. And so when you think about this, oh man, what would that change? I don't know what it would change. It would change me. So holiness is wholeness. And, and this is what he's trying to say. Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. Fill in the blanks. There's a lot of blanks to fill in with that. And so you see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the first six verses of next chapter. And we have just a few minutes to do it. If you give me five minutes of your attention, I promise you it'll be worth it. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And so they, the Pharisees, watched Jesus closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward, and he said to them, he's talking to the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he looked around with them in anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the others. And the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Notice this. There's so much in this. I, I hope you'll go home and think it, think it through. But this is what I wrote down. Well, I wrote down something after that. God said rest, man said made up the rest. Here's what, here's what it was. Jesus got mad at the miserable misers. What's a miserable miser? Think about misery. Misery is miserly. Miser means somebody who's greedy and takes, you know, they don't want to give. They, they have a very small mind and a small heart. And Jesus got mad at that. This is the one time, one of the few times you see Jesus mad. He was not happy. This is not glad Jesus. This is not happy Jesus. Happy hippie Jesus. This is mad Jesus. This is angry, angry bird. And, and the reason is he was looking at stingy, scroogey, starchy people. And the Pharisees instinctively knew that Jesus would go toward the greatest need. This is amazing because they, they set a trap 
They set a trap of a man who had a disability, a man who in that society would have been shunned, a man who in that society would have had trouble finding work, a man in that society who would have been told the curse of God is upon you because if you were good, you would be whole like us and holy like us. But look at you. You have something wrong with you and God has judged you. That's what they would have believed and that's what they would have said. And so here they know Jesus is going to do something about it. He's going to do something about it on the Sabbath, and we are going to find fault with that. I can't even put myself into that mentality. I hope you can't either, but I've observed it. And so if you're here today and you think, man, I'm too needy. I am too needy. God doesn't care about me. Jesus would gravitate toward the person with the greatest need. If you ever want to find out, I wonder, I haven't seen Jesus lately. I haven't felt his presence lately. I kind of feel like I'm missing. Well, maybe... You're in a miserable company and you're missing the misery because Jesus would go right toward it. He's always there. He's always toward the place of great need. Injury or disease or, or disappointment and disillusionment, he's there. But he's not there to just commiserate. He's there to bring true ministry. And so they, he walks right into their trap very happily. He says, oh, okay, I, I, you guys seem to be, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here to see this on the Sabbath. In fact, no better day to do it. No better day to do something good than on the day God said rest, because I find rest, I find that very restful. Ah, it's just nothing quite as refreshing as a changed life for the better. And see, that to them caused them to be restless. They couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand improvement in other people. They liked the power structures the way they were. And so when I think about that again, it got his holy blood boiling. And I, you know, he's probably mad that I didn't get this right. But gee, miserable misers. Just, we'll leave it on that. Before we judge them, judge yourself. That's what I want to do. And again, not to just, oh man, pile on the grief. No, don't pile on the grief. Don't pile on the grief. Don't pile on the guilt. What you do is you pile on the freedom. See, he says, man, is it lawful to do good or bad? Uh, most of the questions Jesus asks are so obvious. You're like, I think I can pass this test. <laughs> uh... Let's see. What should you do on the holy day? Kill or save? Uh, can I have more time? Um, yeah, spend your Sabbath thinking on that one, all right? And yet, these answers are not obvious to most people. I don't get how there's not obvious. But they weren't. This political group, this is what I say. Think about this. It says the Herodians and the Pharisees joined against Jesus. They hated each other. The Pharisees hated the Herodians, but they hated someone more, a man who loved, and that was his ministry. They hated that because it revealed what they had in common, even though they thought they had nothing in common. They had one thing in common. They loved miserable company. And so I think about this and I say, well, that's an RSVP. Next time you get... An, uh, an invitation to misery, turn it down. But the next time you get an invitation to ministry, I invite you, say, yeah, I heard Jesus is going to be there. I think I'll go. That sounds like a good party to go to. Thank you, Lord, for all of this. Thank you for the things that I did and didn't say. Pray that you would Mix all those things together and minister to each heart here. And thank you for the love you have for us. And uh, help us to feast on your truths and uh, enjoy this life that you've given us. It's brief. Uh, The troubles will be over soon and the triumphs will last forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.